never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. It's running out. It's running out. 
All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of my God I will sing to you I'm so glad you are gathering with us this weekend online. In fact, this weekend we are not having physical gatherings. We are only gathering online. We just finished a ton of Christmas services and we saw the Lord do incredible things throughout Orange County and as people were watching online. It has been an incredible season here at Mariner's Church. Last weekend, for the very first time, we had Mariner's Church at OC Rescue Mission. We also took the message from Mariners into 50 senior living facilities. If you wanna be a part of the team that is going to serve at the OC Rescue Mission, we have some information on the screen. Would love for you to join that team. Next weekend, everything kicks back to normal as we start 2021. We're gonna have gatherings online, we're gonna have gatherings in homes, gatherings in our neighborhood locations, and gatherings at HB and Irvine as well. We start a new teaching series Word to the Wise. We're gonna look at some really incredible pithy statements in the book of Proverbs that's really gonna help you start 2021 off with wisdom with your life pointed in the right direction. I'm excited this weekend that Steve Bang Lee is going to be teaching. And so the Lord has brought Bang, I like to call him, to our church. He leads our college ministry, also is serving in North Irvine at our neighborhood location there. And before he comes to teach, I wanna encourage you, if you have not participated in year-end giving, we'll have some information on the screen. This is really the last several days. So much of the work of God through Mariner's Church happens in this week. And so please, join if you haven't joined already. I want you to be a part of all the great things that the Lord is doing through Mariner's Church. Welcome to Mariner's. Well, here we are. We made it. We weren't sure when we'd get here. We weren't sure if we'd get here. 
and it took a little bit longer than we had hoped, but it's finally here. The last few days of 2020, that's right. The last couple days, of, we're almost at the end of 2020. And I'll just say it. Oh, thank God 2020 is coming to an end. Thank God it's coming to an end. It, it's just therapeutic for my soul to even just be able to say that out loud. The camera guy here, he's wiping tears of joy. I, I see you, bro. We have people silently jumping around here. They're so excited. Thank God 2020 is coming to an end. Because, I mean, let's face it, if we took a survey or a poll and we asked everyone to describe 2020 in three words or less, we know what the answer would be. Worst year ever. That's right, I said it. Worst year ever. I mean, sure, it, it didn't start off that way. Actually, 2020, it kind of started off with a bang. I mean, it was, it was the new year. It was the turn of the decade. Uh, it was 2020, the year of clear vision. There was, we stepped into the year with energy and momentum. There were amazing things happening at our church, but then March hit and it felt like everything changed. And we realized that the entire globe was reeling from COVID-19. I mean, there were serious health concerns. There were lives lost stay-at-home orders. I mean, there were job losses, mental health issues and concerns, virtual school, Zoom meetings. Oh, it was so terrible and bad. And then on top of that, you throw in just the pain from the civil unrest and the confusion from the political noise and all the fires that have been happening. It has been a long and brutal year. I am so ready to turn the page. Thank God 2020 is coming to an end because it has been the worst year ever. But is that all that we should think of for 2020? Is that the final conclusion and the only conclusion that we should have about this year? I ask that because whether you are kind of exploring the Christian faith or whether you've been a follower of Jesus for decades, the issue at stake really isn't just about 2020 in isolation. The issue really is the presence of, of trials and challenges and difficulties in our lives and how we should view them, isn't it? Because, you know, the moment the clock strikes midnight on, on New Year's Eve, it's not like all the trials are going to magically disappear from our lives. No, whether it's 2020, whether it's 2021 or any year after, the reality is that trials will always be a part of our lives. And so the question that we need to ask as we look back at 2020 and as we get ready to step into this new year is how should we view trials and hardships? And how we answer that question, oh, it will help us to, to properly understand 2020 and really find proper closure, but it will also give us the right perspective as we step into this new year. So how should we view trials and challenges? How should we understand trials and challenges? Well, we get a stunning and surprising answer from one author in the Bible. Here's what we read in James chapter one, verse two. James says this, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Okay, so wait, hold on. Who wrote this, by the way, Ned Flanders? Someone who was living under a rock during 2020? I mean, is this guy serious? I mean, this has got to be a joke, right? Consider, count, or regard various trials as great joy. Is this verse some kind of sick joke? I mean, is this guy serious? I think he's serious. I think James, the author, is serious. We know this for a couple of reasons. Well, first, um, when we see this verse, it's not written as a suggestion. It's written as a command. James doesn't say, you know, like, if you want, if you feel like it, I would highly suggest, and if you, he doesn't say that. It's a, he uh, writes the verse as a command. He says, I want you to consider it great joy. Count it as great joy. Secondly, I think we know this because of, of who the author is, namely James. James, uh, he was very familiar with trials and hardships. We know this because as the half-brother of Jesus, um, which by the way, being having a brother who was perfect, that's a trial in of, it, of itself. But he watched his own brother be crucified and die on a cross unjustly. And then according to tradition, he was a martyr. He died for his own faith. Tradition has it that he was 
thrown off the pinnacle of a temple because he believed with all of his life the death and resurrection of his half-brother, Jesus. But thirdly, we know this because of who this letter is addressed to, the recipients. Notice the way that he describes them in chapter one, verse one. He says, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. To the 12 tribes dispersed abroad or scattered abroad. Why why would he describe the recipients of the letter as being scattered abroad? Well, it's because they were scattered on account of intense persecution. See, the early Christians in the first century, I mean, every day was a matter of life and death. They were, many of them, hunted for their faith. And by the way, that's just, that's baseline, baseline. I mean, there were other societal stressors and issues that they faced, but every day was a matter of life and death. And so here we have James, who was familiar with various trials, writing to other Christians who were experiencing various trials, and he is commanding them to count and consider and regard their trials as great joy, as great happiness. Now, I just need to confess, like that is very challenging for me and for us to hear those words. I mean, I need a mind diaper. And the reason why is because in our culture, in our context here in Orange County, we actually have uh, already other frameworks or viewpoints or lenses through which how we already view trials. And so when we, with these lenses, knowingly or unknowingly, when we wearing these lenses, try to look at the words of James, we can find his words to be very disorienting and almost incompatible with with what feels like reality. So just to explain that a little bit more, let me uh, just help unpack just two just two of our cultural views for how we see trials and hardships. There's many views, but here are just two. The first view is what I'll call, it's the rose-colored glasses. It's the rose-colored glasses. When when you wear uh, the rose-colored glasses, these are my daughters, by the way, I I can't believe it fits my head, but when you wear the rose-colored glasses, I mean, everything just seems a bit rosier, the lights are brighter, all the darkness and pain and troubles in the world, it seems to almost be doled out a little bit. It's as if the entire world and even the trials are now seen through an Instagram filter. And and when those those who view life and trust through this lens, what we almost do is we almost crop out. We almost edit out all the trials. We refuse to look at them. We only want to look at the positive. We only want to look at that which is good. And so we want to live in denial of the harsh realities of life. I mean, you might know someone like that. This might even be you, right? Where, where we say things like, it's all good. It's all good. I'm just, I'm just living in the sunshine. It's all good. And even when something bad happens, we'll say, oh, it's all good. It's all good. Everything happens for a reason. We're so quick to divert attention away from anything that is hard that we have to face and deal with. Now, there is a benefit to the rose-colored glasses. The benefit is that it can actually make you feel a little bit at ease because you can simply avoid looking at the harshness of, of your trials. But here's the downside. The downside is that those who see trials through this lens will actually begin to lose touch with reality. This is because they are not seeing the world for what it actually is, a world that has trials and hardships. And so we wear these lenses, not because of great faith, but because of great fear from the pain of seeing the trials. This is the rose colored glasses. This is one cultural lens. But there's another cultural lens for which how we view trials. And that's, that's right, safety goggles, safety goggles. Now, when, when we wear the safety goggles, you know what's happening, right? I mean, right now, the dark clouds are rolling in. I can hear the thunder. Uh, it, the, the, there's a cold draft just come in here. Everything is getting scary and worried. And when we, when we view life and our trials through the safety goggles lens, uh, what happens is we, we can almost look for the wrong before anything even goes wrong. But the moment something goes wrong, we zero in on the wrongs and that's all we see. 
We see reality, of, we see the reality of the trials, but that's the only reality that we see. It's about the trials. It's all the pain, all the confusion, all the grief. We see it all, but that's all that we see. And so you might know someone who wears the safety goggles. This might even be you, but we will say things like this, right? We will say, oh, it's all bad. It's just all bad. There's no hope. It's all doom and gloom. And you know what? This is a cold, cold world, my friend. And you're not really my friend. But hey, I'm just a realist. I'm just a realist. Now, there is a benefit to wearing the safety goggles. Much like the other lenses that we wear, the safety goggles will also help you to feel at ease. The reason why is because as you confront the reality of the trials, you, you can now begin to seize control of the circumstance. But there's a downside. When you wear the safety goggles, you will also lose touch with reality. The reality of, of hope, the reality of our felt needs as human beings made in the image of God who need community care, who need love and support. And then ultimately, we lose the reality of ever finding any joy in and beyond the trial. So when we, with these cultural lenses, when we try to look at the words of James, what James just said about finding you know, trials to count them as great joy, it's very disorienting. It's very discomforting. It feels completely incompatible with reality because through this lens, we, we, we like that James references great joy. We love that, but we have no idea how various trials fit in that in view, in the picture. I mean, we like the joy, but how do, trials fit into that. But when you look through the safety goggles, I mean, we love that we can acknowledge and confront the various trials, but we have no idea how great joy fits in that view. So through our cultural lenses, you can have one or the other, you could have joy or trials, but you cannot have joy in trials. You cannot have both. So how do we understand James's words? How do we understand his words when he commands us to count our trials as great joy? Well, I believe that James, he's actually offering a, another route, another way, a third way, a third view for how we should view our trials. And this is, this is the God view, the God view. And the God view, it, it's a completely different paradigm. Because when we look through the God view, we still see the reality of the trials. When we look through the God view, the, the dark clouds can still roll in. You can still hear the thunder. You can still feel the cold draft of life's challenges sweeping through. And sometimes when it rains, it will pour and it's very uncomfortable. Even through the God view, you will grieve and mourn. There will be challenges and sadness. But here's what's amazing about the God view is that though you see the reality of the trials, you see an even fuller reality. Meaning you see the trials, but it's not only the trials that you see. In view, you also see and you believe the reality of God, the God who is, who is good, the God who is loving and kind and compassionate and powerful and he's in control. You believe that he is working, not outside of the trial, but in the very midst of the trial, that he is working and he's leveraging all things for our good. So no, we don't deny, we don't deny the bad circumstances, we acknowledge them. But we also acknowledge the reality that God is good and that God is at work. And so what happens is that in this radically God-centered lens, we come to say, not, not it's all good, it's all good, not it's all bad, it's all bad, but through the God view, we learn to say, God is good, even in the bad. God is good, even when it's bad. And when we look, through the God view, we will see two amazing realities taking place in the very midst of our trials. Here's the first reality that we see. We see that God is working out spiritual transformation through the trials. God is working out spiritual transformation through the trials. 
In other words, God is leveraging the circumstances to work it out to produce a spiritual transforming effect in our lives. In other words, He molds us, He shapes us, He builds us to have the character of Christ, to be more like Jesus, where our strength, our faith, excuse me, becomes strengthened to look more like the faith of Jesus. It's circumstances producing Christ-likeness. This is, this is precisely the reason why uh, James, this is his rationale for why we should count trials as joy. Listen to what he says in verse three. This is beautiful. He says, because, meaning this is the reason, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And you have to let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete lacking nothing. James here, he's saying that God, God uses trials to have a transformative effect in our lives so that it produces in our lives spiritual maturity. We, we know this because of the chain of logic that James utilizes here, right? Did you notice the chain of logic? He says that as trials test our faith or as trials prove out the genuine quality of our faith, it's gonna produce endurance. Endurance, which is perseverance, it's, it's spiritual toughness, or as one commentator said, uh, it's, it's militant patience. I love that. Militant patience. Through endurance, what God is gonna create from that, it's spiritual maturity. It's where God refines certain deficiencies in our character, but God also rounds out even areas of strength so that we become complete, mature, lacking in nothing. God works out spiritual transformation in us through the trials, which means that in the economy of God, trials, it's not a dead end. It's a means to a greater end. I mean, don't we see this principle at work in other areas? I mean, think about uh, working out. For, think about getting in shape, getting in shape. Or in other words, everyone's New Year's resolution until January 5th. But when we work out, what are we doing? We are putting our body under stress, but that creates health. Think about diamonds. How are diamonds created? Through intense pressure and heat. That's why we have, we have the phrase, right? We have the phrase, pressure creates diamonds, which means that when we pray and we ask God, God, would you help me to love that person that's hard to love? God, would you help me to trust you more? God doesn't answer that prayer by simply sending fluttery feelings of love deep into our hearts so that it's easy to love others, or he doesn't cause ro robotic mechanical obedience so that it's easy for us to trust him. As convenient as all those things would be, it would not cause transformation deep inside of us. And so what God lovingly does is he invites us into the, the gym of trials. Now, this is, this is uncomfortable. It's not always pleasant. But in, in, in the end, in the big grand scheme of things, it's the most loving thing that God could do because, invite us into, because it produces the greatest effect, the most important thing, our conformity into the image of his son. That's why I love this quote. God is more concerned with conforming me to the likeness of his son than leaving me in my comfort zones. God is more interested in inward qualities than outward circumstances. Things like refining my faith, humbling my heart, cleaning up my thought life and strengthening my character. Yeah, God is after more than just comfort. He wants us to be like Christ. By the way, the, the person who said this quote, it's none other than the amazing Joni Erickson Tata. Joni Erickson Tata, if you don't know her story, she had her entire future before her at the age of 18 when through a diving injury, uh, she became paralyzed from the shoulders down for the rest of her life. She is familiar with trials. And yet she said these incredible words. Listen to this. She said, my wheelchair, it was the key to seeing all this happen. So here I sit, glad, glad that I have not been healed on the outside, but glad that I have been healed on the inside, healed from my own self-centered wants and wishes. I mean, this is, this is the God view. This is Joni Erickson Tata 
saying, I'm going to have a radically God-centered view where I see my trials, not through this lens, it's all good, not, not through this one, it's all bad, but no, God is good even in the bad. Which means that for you and me, as we look back at 2020, oh, we can acknowledge the trials. We should acknowledge the grief. We should grieve and mourn, absolutely. But at the same time, we can and should acknowledge that God, through the trials, because He is good, He has worked out miraculous spiritual transformation inside of you and me. For many of us, for some of us, this was the year where God graciously helped us to confront our own impatience and anger. Sure, I mean, there were other years where maybe we had to face certain character issues, but this was the year more than any other year where, where God was working out a transformation inside of us. For others of us, this was the year where, where you grew to trust God more than any other year previous. You really believe this year, because of this year, that God is your gracious Father who will take care of you. Others of us, we, God invited us to reconcile in a broken relationship. Maybe there was an issue and it was this year where God worked that out in our midst. See, for us, we are not at the mercy of our trials. We're not at the mercy of our circumstances. No, we receive grace through our circumstances, the grace of becoming more like Jesus. And this is what we see because of reality one, that God works out spiritual transformation through the trials. Now, I admit, I forget this all the time. I forget it all the time. And especially in a year like 2020, or whenever we're going through trials, it's really hard to have that perspective. And this is why I love reality too, because God does not leave us without a resource. Reality too is this. When we look through the God view, we see that God is willing to give divine wisdom in our trials. God is willing to give us divine wisdom in our trials trials, meaning that in the very midst of our circumstances, God will give us the right perspective that we need to believe that He's working out transformation inside of us. See, what you and I need, we can agree, we, we need more than just mere information or knowledge, right? Because we can know intellectually all the right things about what God is doing in the midst of trials, but in a way that doesn't really impact us. What we need is is the right perspective of the right piece of information, which is then applied to us at the right time in the right way. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. And that's what we need in the midst of our trials. But here's what I love. What I love is that James says, you can ask God for wisdom and he'll give it to you. Notice what he says in verse five. I love this verse. He says, now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. Don't you love that? Our, our God, our Father, he, He's so kind. He's so gracious. He not only works out spiritual transformation in us through the trials, but He is willing to give us the divine wisdom, the right perspective that we need in the very midst of the trial. That's who our Father, we just need to ask. We just need to ask him for wisdom and he'll give it to us. You know, um, the person who helps me to see that God really does give us wisdom like this is actually my father. It's my dad. You know, around this time of the year, last year, my father, um, he, he actually received a cancer diagnosis and I share this with his permission. And when we received his diagnosis, it was really fascinating to see the contrast between his response and, and my response in the subsequent months to come. For me, um, while I may know certain information about theology, I was reeling. I mean, I was staggering around. I, I struggled so much. I mean, for a season I, I was putting on, I was like, it's, gonna, it's all gonna be okay. My dad's gonna, it, it, there's gonna be no problem. It's gonna be so great. And then I toggled back to you know, this and I said, oh my gosh, this is so bad. This is doom and gloom. What am I going to do? And then I would toggle back between then and even the Bible, right? I try to have the God view, but oh, Leviticus, right? I just struggled so much, just going back and forth. I really, really struggled. My father, on the other hand, he held the God view the whole time. That's not to say that he 
deny the reality of his diagnosis. No, no, no. He, he fully understood the potential implications of his diagnosis. And I know that there were moments where it was heavy on his heart, especially during the chemo treatment. I, I could see it on his face. But, but while he acknowledged the trials, he leaned into fuller realities and he acknowledged that God was present. I mean, in our conversations, he would say so often, but God, yes, yes, that's true, but God. There were moments when he would share even just the gratitude from what God was teaching him in that season. This isn't because my dad, you know, it's because of his Enneagram or because of some Zen-like, you know, attitude. I know why my dad had this posture. I know why he had this wisdom. It's because for the last 30 years, my father has woken up at 5 a.m. every single morning and devoted the first hour to prayer. And in that first hour of prayer, one of the things that he asked for, it's wisdom. So of course he's gonna be wise. Of course, he's only been asking for wisdom for the last 30 years every single morning. So our father who is in heaven sees my father asking, of course, he's just gonna just drench him with the wisdom that he needs. No wonder whether it was pre-diagnosis or after the diagnosis, my dad had the exact same perspective. He had the God view the entire time. So the early bird gets the wisdom, the wisdom. Now here's what's amazing. My father, when he received, even when he received good news and he did receive some good news, he even received the good news through the God lens, through the God view. So, so whether it was good news or bad news, it didn't matter. My dad's posture was God is good even in the bad and God is good even in the good. This is what we get because we can ask God for wisdom. By the way, this is why I'm so grateful and excited that next weekend, we're gonna start a brand new teaching series, A Word to the Wise, our first teaching series of the new year. It's gonna be on wisdom in the book of Proverbs. It's gonna be such a great way for us to dive into the new year, asking God for wisdom. Also, our annual read is all about wisdom. It's every single day looking into a proverb to get wisdom from God. And we can be a people who step into this because of reality too, when we look through the God view. God is willing to give wisdom in the midst of our trials. I love that. As the people of God, we don't have to be a people who simply say, it's all good. We don't have to be a people who simply say, it's all bad. Instead, we are invited with a God view to say God is good, even in the bad. Because we know that God will triumph even in the trials. And that's why we can count and consider our trials as joy. Could we view 2020 this way? Could you and I look back, even if we don't fully understand everything, even if we don't fully feel it, could we, holding the, the God view, could we actually look back at 2020 and count the joy? And what would it look like if we stepped into the new year with the God view, with this perspective. I don't know about you, but for me, when, when I think about this, when I think this way, it starts to fill my heart with some encouragement and courage as I step into the new year. Because I know that no matter what happens, no matter what circumstance or situation comes my way, I know that my God, He is bigger still. I know that none of God's plans will be thwarted. All of His purposes and plans will stand. Oh sure, the trials may rage, but your God, my God, He is bigger, He's stronger, He's mightier, and He is in control. He will get all the glory and he will work out all things for the, good of those that, for the good of those who love him. He will leverage all trials for your good and my good. And we can take that to the bank. So 2020, checkmate, well played. 2021, bring it on, let's go. Why? Because we have a good God who will be with us even when it's bad. And here's how we can know this, because of our savior, Jesus. See, I love that Jesus, when he came to the earth, to achieve righteousness, right standing with God on your behalf and my behalf. I'm so glad he, he didn't simply say, oh, I don't see any sin here. 
I'm so glad he didn't deny reality, but I'm so glad that he didn't just say, oh, you're all bad, take care of it on your own. I'm so glad that instead Jesus, full of wisdom, he took upon himself the greatest trial in history. He died to pay for the penalty of our sins and thereby freeing us from the power of our sin. And as he did this, he counted the joy. I love this. This is what Hebrews 12, 2 says. For the joy that lay before him, Jesus, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Even our Jesus had a radically God-centered view and he triumphed over his trial. And that's why he will also triumph over our trial. So Mariners, 2020, it was tough, but let's count the joy because God is bigger still. And as we move forward into 2021, we can say confidently, God, you are good, even when it's not, even when it's bad. So let's stand, let's sing, let's celebrate. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph No, my God will never fail I believe, no, my God will never fail Cause I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a
Thanks so much for worshiping together. Such a joy to be with you. Hey, next weekend, we're starting a new series, Word to the Wise. You are not gonna wanna miss this series. What better way than to dive into the new year, gaining wisdom in the book of Proverbs. It's gonna be so great, so please join. You're not gonna wanna miss it. Would you hold out your hand, receive God's blessing? Father, we confess and we acknowledge that this year has been filled with trials. We don't wanna deny the reality of the hardships. But at the same time, we also want to acknowledge the amazing work that you have and are doing and will continue to do in us, through us, and through our church. And so would you help us now as we step forward into this new year? Would you give us wisdom, the wisdom that we need to have a God-centered perspective? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance towards you and give you peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great new year.